Good morning and a very warm welcome to our service of morning prayer from St. Denis Lisbane. It's wonderful to be with you this morning to worship our great and glorious God together. An especially warm welcome if this is the first time that you've been able to join us. I'm delighted that you have found us and you're able to join us this morning in worship. Well, today we're going to be continuing the series that we've been in throughout the summer, looking at the Psalms. Today we'll be looking at Psalm 51. Well, let me begin by reading some words to you from the end of Matthew 11, the words of Jesus. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So often we think that God must be stern, disapproving, must sort of grudgingly accept our worship. But actually what we read here, those words of Jesus, tell us that he is gentle and humble in heart, that he invites us to come to him, and that as we do so, we will find rest. Let us pray. Father God, we praise you that we are able to worship you this morning. We pray that as we do so, we would be able to come to you with all of our burdens, all of our worries and anxieties, and that as we come to you, so we would find the rest that you promise. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let us continue our worship in the words of our first hymn, Come, let us join our cheerful songs. We continue with a reminder of why it is that we gather together. Beloved in Christ, we are here in the presence of the living God and of the whole company of heaven to offer to him through our Lord Jesus Christ our worship and praise and thanksgiving that we may know more truly the greatness of his love and that his grace may bear fruit in our lives. We have come to hear and receive God's holy word, to seek the strengthening power of the Holy Spirit, and to pray for ourselves and all mankind, that we may be given those things which are necessary for our true well-being. But first, let us confess our sins and seek our Father's pardon and peace. In 1 John, we are reminded that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, 
and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so trusting in his promises, let us come to him in confession. We confess to God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. Wherefore we pray God to have mercy upon us. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us all our sins and deliver us from evil. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Well, we have come to hear and receive God's holy word. And the Ollerton family will now bring us God's word for this morning. 2 Samuel 11, David and Bathsheba. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of a lion, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I'm pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab. Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were doing, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the palace with the servants of the king. He did not go down to his house. When David was told Uriah did not go home, he asked him, haven't you just come from a distance? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are out staying in tents and my master Joab and my Lord's men are camping out in the open fields. How can I go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as I live, as surely as you live, I will do no such a thing. Then David said to him, stay here one more day then and tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David's invitation, he ate and drank with him and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, 
David wrote a letter. It was to Joab and he sent it with Uriah. In it he wrote, put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw for him so that he'll be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest offenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Joab sent David a full account of the battle and he instructed the messenger, when you finish giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up and he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jerobesheth? Didn't a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, Also, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. The messenger set out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab sent him to say. The messenger came to David. The men overpowered us and came out against us in the open. We drove them back to the entrance to the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant, Uriah the Hittite, is dead. David told the messenger, say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Psalm 51 Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict, and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to, the, to me the joy of your salvation and grant me with a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are my... You who are God my saviour, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in sacrifices of the righteous, in burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered at it. Luke 15, 1-8. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. 
Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Let's pray. Father, we praise you that you are a God who speaks, who speaks through your word. And so we pray as we consider that word together now that we would hear your voice in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most tragic events in the news in recent weeks has been the drowning of the boys off the coast of Litham St Anne's. You'll remember that two brothers and their cousin went out onto the water in a dinghy. And you can imagine just what it would have been like. It would have been exciting. They perhaps would have known that it wasn't the wisest thing to go out onto the sea in a dinghy. They may have known they should have been wearing life jackets, but they went ahead anyway. It was great fun until they found themselves in a situation where they realised that they were out of their depth and in serious trouble. They were alone. They were isolated. They were in desperate need of rescue. And our spiritual lives can be exactly the same. We can slowly drift away from God until we come to the point where we realise we have simply drifted too far. We're in serious trouble. We're in desperate need of rescue. We want to come home, but we don't know if there will be a way. Well, that's exactly what happened to David, and it's the story that lies behind the psalm we're looking at this morning, Psalm 51. At the beginning of the psalm, you'll see that we're told that it was written after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. You can read the whole gory story in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. We had chapter 11 read to us. It's been described as the most serious collection of sins in one event that a believer in the Bible ever committed. David was the leader of God's people, but he sins by committing adultery with Bathsheba, who was already married. And then when David finds out that she has become pregnant, he tries to firstly compromise her husband's integrity, and when he won't budge, he effectively murders him, and along with him, those soldiers who die around him. It's hard to imagine a more serious sin. But notice first how it starts. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, we read, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. His catastrophic, spectacular sins don't begin with adultery and murder. It begins with a far less serious sin, failing to lead his army in battle. You see, sin is always the same. It always looks fairly harmless to begin with. But before David knows it, he is out of his depth and he is in desperate need of rescue. And our sin is exactly the same. So what do we do when we find ourselves in that situation? Our sin is unlikely to be as serious as David's, but you may feel this morning that you have been drifting away from God. It may be that you just feel your heart is growing cold, or it may be that you've committed some sin, or maybe there's a repeated sin and you just simply cannot seem to break the cycle, and you don't know how to get back to God you may feel too ashamed to even come to him. Sin does that. It makes us feel isolated and helpless and alone and unworthy. 
And in such situations, the great lie that we are prone to believe is that there is no way back. We are simply unworthy, not worthy to be called God's children anymore. But Psalm 51 reassures us that whenever we have sinned, Whenever we have begun to drift away from him, whenever we find ourselves out of depth, our depth, in fact, whenever we find that we've hit rock bottom as David had done, God has made a way for us to come back to him, to be completely forgiven and to have the joy of our salvation restored to us. Psalm 51, David's reflections after his catastrophic sin tell us that there are really three things that we must do if we find ourselves in that situation. Firstly, we must remember it's all about mercy and not merit. In verses 1 and 2, David cries out to God, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He completely casts himself on God's grace and his mercy. He doesn't remind him about all the good things that he has done in the past, and he doesn't make rash promises about what he will do for God in the future. There's no bargaining with God here. He simply throws himself on God's mercy. But even though he has sinned more spectacularly than I think any of us will, he throws himself on God's mercy in confidence because he knows God's character. He knows who God is. He knows firstly that God is love. Verse 1, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. God loves his people with an unfailing love. The word there for unfailing love in Hebrew is hesed. It's a word that's used to describe God's faithful, enduring, loyal love to his people, even when they sin. David may have sinned, and he may have sinned catastrophically, but he knows God. He knows God's heart, and so he casts himself on his mercy. And then secondly, he knows that God is a God of great compassion. Not just a God of compassion, but a God of great compassion. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. God has compassion on those who are helpless, on those who are totally dependent on him, on those who are in desperate need of rescue. And so here in the first two verses of the psalm, we see that the foundation of the whole of the psalm is not David's merits, but God's mercy. And God's love and mercy, of course, were ultimately displayed at the cross. It was at the cross that the Son of God laid down his life for his people, bore their punishment so that they might be brought into relationship with him, they might be forgiven, that they might know the joy of knowing him and the life that he offers. You see, God doesn't forgive grudgingly. He delights to forgive. He wanted to go to the cross. He wanted to die for you so that you could know him. And so whenever we find that we have begun to drift away from God or we have sinned, we must remember that God will not accept us back because of something that we have done, but he will accept us back because of his mercy. It is all about his mercy, not our merits. The second thing we see in the psalm is this, that we must Be absolutely honest about our sin. That's where David goes next in verses 3 to 6. Let me read verses 3 and 4 to you. 
For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. David doesn't try to conceal or hide or excuse his sin. He is absolutely honest before God. I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. You know, God doesn't require that we beat ourselves up about our sin, but he does require that we are honest about our sin. What does David say about his sin? Well, he says three things. Firstly, he confesses that his sin is not just wrongdoing, but it is in fact rebellion. I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. On the one hand, David calls what he has done sin. Sin is wrongdoing. The word for sin literally meant to miss the goal or miss the mark. Imagine someone shooting at a target. When they miss the bullseye, they miss the mark. They fall short. Well, that's what the word meant. And so it came to mean to fall short of a particular standard. It came to mean to do wrong. But David also calls what he has done transgression. And that basically means rebellion. The word appears in military context to describe military rebellions. So to sin is to do wrong, but it's more than that. It is to rebel against God. What lies behind all sin is a rebellious heart, a heart that doesn't want to submit to God's will but a heart that wants to be the captain of its own ship, to be the master of its own fate. Sin, at its root, is rebellion. The second thing David confesses about his sin is that it is against God alone. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Now you might think, well, hang on a minute. He has committed adultery. He's tried to compromise Bathsheba's husband's integrity. And then he has killed him together with the other soldiers who were with him in battle. I think he may have sinned against people as well. Well, you're right. He has sinned against people. He has sinned against Bathsheba, against Uriah, against those other soldiers. They are all made in God's image and God has entrusted them to David's care as king of his people and he has treated them despicably. But what David is saying is that the greatest offence is the offence that he has caused God. God is their creator. He is the judge of all. He is the one to whom he must ultimately give account. And so he has sinned against others. But above all, he has sinned against God. And then the third and final thing that David confesses about his sin is that his sin is far deeper than just his actions. Surely I was sinful at birth, Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You see, David sees that his sin problem is not simply that he has sinned, but it's that he is a sinner. Or to put it another way, he is not a sinner because he has sinned, but rather he has sinned because he is a sinner. His sin problem goes far deeper than simply his actions There is something desperately wrong with his heart. I don't remember those old shopping trolleys, the ones with the wonky wheels that you just couldn't get to steer in a straight path. Well, his heart, he says, is something like that. There is this constant drift away from God and towards evil. There is something wrong inside him. There's something wrong with his heart. Well, David confesses his sin. He hides nothing from God as he tells him about his sin. 
He is absolutely honest before him. And then having confessed his sin, David goes on with the most tremendous boldness to ask God to meet his every need. Verses 7 to 12. First, David prays that he might be forgiven. In the play Macbeth, after Macbeth has carried out his murders, he is racked with guilt. And he says that all the seas in all the world couldn't wash the stain of blood from his hands. But God's power to forgive is far greater than all of the oceans in the world. When God forgives, we are made completely clean. Or as David puts it, we are made whiter than the snow. Now the snow, I guess, would have been the whitest, purest, cleanest thing that David had ever encountered. And when God washes away his sin, notice carefully what he says. He doesn't say that he will be as white as snow. No, he says that when God forgives him, he'll be whiter even than the snow. The forgiveness that God offers is total and complete. God does nothing by half measures. And then secondly, David goes on to pray for a restoration of his joy and gladness. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. His sin has shattered his relationship with God. He has been robbed of the joy and gladness that he once knew. Now, in one sense, God could have said to him, well, I'll forgive your sins, and then I'm going to leave it at that. But God does nothing by half measures. With the cleansing that he's received comes a complete restoration of his relationship with God. The rift is closed. The wound is healed, joy and gladness return and his crushed and broken bones rejoice. And that is what God will do for anyone who casts themselves on his mercy. It's what God delights to do for his repentant people. In fact, God finds more joy in restoring you to relationship with him than you find in being restored. So David prays for a restoration of his joy and gladness. And then thirdly, David prays for renewal. To be cleansed, to have his joy and gladness restored is wonderful, but David knows it's not enough. As we've seen, David's problem is twofold. He has sinned, but he's also a sinner. He has something wrong with his heart and unless God does something about that then he knows what the future holds he knows he's just going to come back and do the same thing over and over again and so in verses 10 to 12 David asks God to do more than simply forgive his sin he asks that he would bring about an inner transformation a renewal of his very being Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David knows that he must be made new on the inside. And we too can be made new on the inside. God wants not simply to forgive us, not simply to restore our joy and gladness, but he wants to give us a new heart. To create in us a heart that is both steadfast and faithful and committed, verse 10, and a heart that is willing, a heart that desires to do what God commands. How is this possible? It's possible through the gift of the Holy Spirit, verse 11. And that's why David prays that the Holy Spirit wouldn't be taken from him.
So like David, let us pray, not just for our sin to be forgiven, not just for our joy and gladness to be restored, but that God would do a work of creation, a work of new creation in our hearts. Now that work may be instantaneous, but it's more likely to take time. We are works in progress, people under construction. But don't despair. Take heart in what Paul says in his letter to the Philippians. Philippians 1 verse 6, Paul reminds us to be confident because he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Well, in the remainder of the psalm, David goes on to look towards the future and he shows us the changes that are going to come as a result of having been forgiven, restored and renewed in his relationship with God. Now, we haven't got time to look at these in detail, but very briefly. Firstly, we see verse 13 that he will teach transgressors how to turn back to God. In other words, having been restored to God himself after this catastrophic sin, he says, I will show others the way, which is, of course, is what he does by writing this psalm. And then secondly, he says that he will sing about and declare God's praise from now on, verses 14 and 15. From now on, his life is going to be marked by a heart that resonates with a new song. He already knew God's love, God's grace, God's mercy and compassion, but perhaps now he knows it in a new depth and he has a new song in his heart. And then thirdly, his worship and I think his whole life is going to be marked by a broken and a contrite heart. He has this newfound humility in his relationship with God. What can we say by way of conclusion? Well, we all have hearts that are inclined to drift away from God. We can easily find ourselves isolated, alone, unsure of how to get back. This psalm shows us the way. It shows us that first we must remember it's not about our merits. It's all about God's mercy, his love and compassion. Secondly, we need to be absolutely honest about our sin. We need to acknowledge that it's not just wrongdoing, it is rebellion. That it is, above all, sin against God himself. And that it's not just our actions, but it's our very nature that is the problem. And thirdly, we can come to him confidently. And we can ask him not just for forgiveness not just for the restoration of joy and gladness in relationship with him, but we can ask him to put a new spirit within us, a new song in our hearts. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you that in your providence you have given us this psalm, a psalm that reminds us that whatever we have done, there is a way back to you, a way in which we can be restored, forgiven and renewed. And so, Father, we pray, pray for all those who are listening. Lord, we pray that you would give us the faith to cry out to you, to trust in your mercy, that we might know that restoration. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us affirm our faith in God together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. Endue thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people, and bless thine inheritance. O Lord, save the Queen, and give her counsellors wisdom. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and ever more mightily defend us. Make clean our hearts, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Almighty God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom stands our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy servants, in all dangers and adversities, that surely, trusting in thy defence, we may serve thee without fear, through the power of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance, to do always what is righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We turn now to our intercessions. O oh God, we praise you for your grace and mercy and unfailing love. That you should set your love upon us at all is remarkable. But that you should continue to love us after we repeatedly turn away from you is astonishing. We thank you that such is your heart, O oh God, that you came to us in Jesus and took our place at the cross so that all of our sin can be forgiven. We freely acknowledge our sin before you. We confess that we have been sinners from the time of our conception. And so we ask that you would not just forgive us our sin and blot out our transgressions, but that you would also create in us a pure heart. Give us a steadfast spirit, a spirit that is not easily drawn aside by temptation. Give us a willing spirit, a spirit that rejoices to do your will. Change the desires of our hearts, that we might love you and our neighbours and not ourselves. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we remember your holy Catholic and apostolic church, which you have purchased with your precious blood. We ask that you would confirm and strengthen it, 
enlarge and multiply it. Keep it in peace and preserve it, unconquerable by the gates of hell forever. We pray especially for the persecuted church this morning, remembering those who have recently lost loved ones and their homes because of their faith, both in Nigeria and Burkina Faso. We pray that having nothing, they might know that having you, they have all things. We remember Exodus Church and Bale. We pray for Pastor Andrew and for the congregation there. We pray for the team at St. Dennis who are committed to supporting that church and we pray that you would strengthen our relationship with them, bringing mutual understanding and showing us how we can best support them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church in Wales. We pray for June, our bishop, for Peggy, our archdeacon, for Stuart, our area dean. We pray for the other clergy who serve in this diocese and for all those who serve alongside them. We pray that they might teach transgressors your ways so that sinners would turn back to you. We pray that you might open their lips, that they might sing of your righteousness and declare your praise. We pray especially this morning for Citizen Church as they begin their work in this deanery. We pray that they would quickly find their feet in the diocese, in the deanery and in the parish. We pray that they would adapt well to the changes that the pandemic has brought. And we ask that you would enable them to creatively engage the student body and residents in their local area. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those school children who have been receiving results in the last few weeks in less than ideal circumstances. We pray that you would have mercy on them we ask that you would give them wisdom as they make decisions regarding their future training and careers. And above all, we pray that you would be at work in that generation to bring many to know you as their Lord and Saviour. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, we pray for all those who are suffering in mind, body or spirit. In the light of the news this week that rates of depression were nearly double the average in June, we pray especially for those who have been suffering the effects of long-term isolation and for those who are still fearful of leaving their homes. We pray for those in this parish who are suffering and pray that you would open the way for us as a church to meet their needs. We pray for those who are suffering in our church family, whether through bereavement, ill health, or spiritual difficulty. And in a moment of silence, we pray for those who are known to us personally. We thank you that you are the God of all grace and compassion, the God who is gentle and lowly in heart. We pray that you would comfort the afflicted, that they might know the rest that Jesus offers, even in the midst of trials. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you have promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, that when we meet in his name, and pray according to his mind, he will be among us and hear our prayer. In your love and mercy, fulfill our desires and give us your greatest gift, which is to know you, the only true God, and your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. In Psalm 51, David asked God to create in him a pure heart, to give him a steadfast and willing spirit. Well, that theme is taken up in our final hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. I'm delighted that you've been able to join us for morning prayer this morning. It's been wonderful to be with you. St. Dennis will be opening for its first public service of worship for many months on the 6th of September. It would be wonderful if you could join us. The service will take place at 9 o'clock in the morning. It will be, of course, socially distanced. And if you are able to join us, then please do contact Denise Searle, our parish administrator, who will be able to give you more details. These are her details. You may just want to pause the video at this point to jot them down. To God the Father, 
who first loved us and made us accepted in the beloved, to God the Son who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, to God the Holy Spirit who sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts, be all love and glory for time and for eternity. Amen.